Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today as we uh, discuss diversity, equity, and inclusion in agriculture. Uh, my name is Rafael Alvarez Febo. I am the Executive Director for the Pennsylvania Commission on LGBTQ Affairs, and I will be the moderator for today's discussion. We are delighted to have so many of you tune in to learn more about this important topic that affects Pennsylvanians in every zip code across the Commonwealth. Tonight, today's panel will focus on groups uh, and programs that are working tirelessly to increase opportunities and remove barriers in agriculture. Prior to my role as executive director for the Commission of LGBTQ Affairs, I was uh, in charge of running an urban garden here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a, a garden that was started by a group of mostly women um, who had gone through some social trauma and they basically got together, created a support group, and started to reconnect to agriculture. Uh, as someone from Puerto Rico, and most of these women having a Puerto Rican background, uh, learning how to reconnect with the soil was extremely important, and learning where our food came from. Um, many people in our culture have been uh, separated from agriculture and their supply chains, and uh, having this kind of garden and this resource literally blocks away from my current home um, has been something that has been a great experience. The uh, uh, urban garden was an intergenerational experience where young people, not so young people, uh, and all folks would come together to really have a cross-cultural uh, experience. So uh, this topic of diversity is uh, not something that's uh, light. It's something that really talks about how we can reconnect um, to not just agriculture, not just our food production, but also just the essence of what makes us uh, people. So I'm, I'm really committed to this work of diversity in agriculture. Uh, everyone eats, right? Everyone uh, participates in our agricultural economy and um, having more individuals uh, understand how important agriculture is, is really uh, personally uh, important to me. So with that, uh, I would like to talk about who we're joined by. We're joined by, of course, Pennsylvania Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Russell Redding, uh, Stefan Fitzpatrick, Manners Region 1 and 2 graduate vice president, uh, Honey R White, uh, co-founder of Feed the Barrel, Caleb Wright, chief operating officer of Versus Strategies, uh, Karen Gardner, Pennsylvania manager of Young National Young Farmers, and I believe Desi Burnett, statewide coordinator, uh, the movement of immigrant leaders in Pennsylvania. Uh, so those are our panelists. Um, oh, and also Abby uh, Spackman, uh, Agribility Case Coordinator and Project Assistant at Penn State University. Um, those are our esteemed panelists, and uh, now we will uh, hear from Secretary Redding. Hey, Raphael, thank you, and uh, th thank you for the kind introduction. I mean, I uh, really appreciate uh, certainly your work in, in public service, but your prior experiences of uh, you know, watching the power of food to change lives uh, in, in your community is, is really a, a great sort of uh, reminder to all of us of the importance of food and agriculture, as you note, but also uh, gives us sort of the foundation of today's conversation uh, for, uh, for all of us and, and those who are watching. To our panelists, uh, it is great to see you. It's great to be with you and thank you for, for joining us uh, as well. Uh, the, uh, 2021 Farm Show um, is is upon us. Uh, we we uh, decided early on that we wanted to do uh, you know something in, in, that would brought a lot of these contemporary issues to to the table. And this panel series was developed, and today uh, being being one of those that uh, we have as a theme for the Farm Show of cultivating tomorrow. Uh, it was very intentional. Uh, it was to express both the aspiration. We all feel for that day uh, to regain some of the freedoms and traditions uh, to include Farm Show, but also an expression of hope uh, and the actions required to achieve it. One of those actions uh, is ensuring that we are intentional, that we're inclusive, that we respect diversity, recognizing that we must feed equality uh, to feed the future. Racism and inequality affect us all, including agriculture. It has for centuries. Uh, as COVID-19 has reminded us, uh, there has been a disproportionate impact on communities of color and especially the black communities, making our work even more urgent. As we gather to celebrate agriculture and cultivate that tomorrow that we all desire, now is the time for agriculture to do what agriculture does best, 
to band us together, to do it in support of and solidarity uh, with our neighbors for our neighbors. Uh, we are living in a time where everyone wants and needs equal access to opportunity. We need to make more opportunities available in agriculture for people of color, people with disabilities, uh, really anyone who wants a seat at the table. I want them to understand that they are welcome here, regardless of who they are and where they are on life's journey. They deserve the same access without barriers to this industry and vocation that brings so much to those who pursue it. I'm committing our Department of Agriculture to being more equitable, more diverse, and more inclusive. We formed an internal committee, Project JUST, which stands for Justice, Unity, Solidarity, and Tolerance. This important diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative was inspired by one of our staff members, which I think makes it even more important. Michelle Brookins, who is an administrative assistant in the Bureau of Market Development, that reached out to suggest that we create a working group following, following my blog back in June, which called for racial equity and equality. And I thank her for that uh, proactive move. I firmly believe that every industry, including agriculture, has a role to play in ensuring equity for all Pennsylvanians. We're working every day to remove those barriers that hold us back uh, from fulfilling their dreams and want to make sure that agriculture is a place that they can realize those dreams. I believe there is much more we have to do as a nation, as a state, as an industry. Our strength, as we say often, is our diversity. I say that as the Secretary of Agriculture, but also as a Commonwealth, that is our strength. To truly honor that diversity, I'll be more intentional to make the industry more diverse, equitable, and accessible. The people in this panel today are doing extraordinary work to remove barriers, create the opportunities. And I've had the honor of learning from many of you. So thank you. And I look forward to today's conversation. Raphael. Thank you, Secretary Redding. Um, as outlined by the Secretary, agriculture affects every one of us in uh, many ways in our daily lives. Yet a, only a small percentage of the population is involved in agriculture. Um, I want to turn it to Karen. Can you tell us a little bit about the trends uh, you've seen in, uh, in your work at the National Young Farmers um, on what draws people to agriculture and some of the barriers and opportunities in that pursuit? Absolutely. Um, first, thank you so much for having me here today. It's a real honor to be part of the first ever virtual farm show, though um, I'm really missing all of the animals and missing seeing all of you in person. Um, and thank you, Secretary Redding, for your remarks. I'm, I'm really grateful to have someone who is such a creative thinker and who is such a thoughtful listener um, at the helm of our Department of Agriculture. Um, so I'm grateful for your leadership. To answer the question about trends that you asked, Raphael, um, there's a couple key trends that feel really important to talk about. In Pennsylvania and across the country, we're not seeing enough young farmers stepping in to replace our retiring farmers. For every um, three farmers in Pennsylvania who are over 65, there's only one under 35. And just between 2012 and 2017, the Commonwealth lost more than 6,000 farms with 400,000 acres transitioning out of farmland. So it's clear that we need more young and beginning farmers to step into agriculture. And I meet with new folks um, every week who are really excited about working hard and are saving and getting trained and taking risks to start or continue a farm. But they're also trying to figure out how to make the math work. Uh, without adequate, I apologize, access to land, uh, to workforce development, to capital, and more. And as we're reckoning with this crisis of attrition, we're also seeing across the country and in Pennsylvania that young farmers are increasingly first-generation farmers. They're increasingly Black, Indigenous, and people of color. They're increasingly women and increasingly LGBTQ+. And these young farmers face disproportionate barriers to entering agriculture. For instance, in the United States, white individuals own 98% of farmland and receive the vast majority of agriculture-related financial assistance. This landscape reflects the obstacles that underrepresented farmers face and the need for collective action on 
labor protections, and anti-racist agricultural policy. So to address the second part of your question about what draws people to agriculture, um, I think there's, there's more to say there than I will have time here. Uh, so I will say that there's a lot of really amazing reasons why Pennsylvania is a great place to be a farmer. And I hear about those reasons every day. And that's why it's so exciting to look at what we can do um, to open that opportunity more proactively to young and beginning farmers across Pennsylvania. And, and on that note, to address the barriers and opportunities that you asked about, there are the following barriers are uh, most pressing specifically to young farmers in Pennsylvania. Finding secure access to affordable, high quality farmland, accessing on farm learning opportunities that pay a living wage and teach both the mechanics and business of farming, access to business and technical services appropriate to diverse and evolving models of farming, crushing student loan debt. And finally, disinvestment in and discrimination against communities of color heighten each of these barriers and are critical to each of these barriers. So as far as opportunities go, first and foremost, we have the opportunity to prioritize equity and anti-racism in every step of agricultural policy. California has demonstrated a successful model for resourcing their Department of Agriculture with a staff person specifically dedicated to their work within this work within the executive office. And I would encourage the General Assembly to pass legislation to fund a position, such a position here. Second, we need to support everyone in our agricultural community. A very first step towards affirming the human rights of many agricultural farm workers in Pennsylvania is to pass legislation that will allow undocumented Pennsylvanians to apply for unmarked driver's licenses using an IRS issued tax ID number, as has been passed in 15 states and the District of Columbia. Greater stability in the lives of undocumented farm workers means greater stability on our farms. Third, we have the opportunity to protect farmland affordability. Our farmland preservation program is by many measures the most successful in the country. At the same time, we continue to see the price of farmland, including, including preserved farmland, rise above what working farmers can pay. A good solution is working farm easements. These have worked to keep farmland affordable and in farmers' hands in states such as Vermont, Massachusetts, and New York. Fourth, we've heard strong demand for more on-farm training opportunities, and it's important that we meet that demand. Colorado and New Mexico have built up successful models to do this. They give financial support and assistance to the farmers and organizations who train and um, hire on-farm apprentices. Finally, farmers are disproportionately affected by climate change. They're also uniquely positioned to make significant progress towards mitigating climate change. We have the opportunity to build upon examples of states such as Oklahoma, Iowa, and others. They've paid farmers to shift towards farming practices that fight climate change. These practices include sequestering carbon, improving soil health, and others. I think that we're at a really important point of transition. Policymakers in Pennsylvania have shown their commitment and interest in sustaining and supporting our evolving agricultural industry. So it's essential that we enact equitable and anti-racist policy to specifically invest in our next generation of farmers. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I, I did, um, you know, as you were making remarks, I, I, I did have a little bit of a follow-up. I know that there's a, a big trend in like across the country, but also in Pennsylvania, where uh, young people in particular are moving into, into cities. Uh, you know, so suburban young people are moving into cities and actually people from cities are moving into suburban and rural areas. This is very uh, common in Pennsylvania. Uh, the, the 222 quarter is a prime example of people moving out of New York uh, because of gentrification and other social issues. And I, I just I'm interested in in just hearing a brief kind of, uh, I don't know, a, a an overview or some type of uh, response to how does that affect uh, how we approach diversity in agriculture? We have young uh, white individuals moving into cities and we have 
uh, young people of colors uh, of color moving out of them uh, and into rural areas? How how does that affect um, our approach to um, changing the job market? I think that um, one thing that seems really important and that we hear a lot about in specifically thinking about that trend is how land is distributed and sold. Um, there are there is a, a long history of word of mouth sales for farmland um, and there's a long history of um, handshake leases um, and and we have heard specifically from young farmers in Pennsylvania that uh, farmers of color, female farmers, LGBTQ farmers are sometimes not part of the, um, you know, word of mouth communities where they're hearing about land um, first or even in the appropriate time in which they can lease that land, buy that land, be part of new farming um, work. And so that there's several different policy solutions to that. Um, one is, I think, just making sure that with farm policy, we are really prioritizing outreach and prioritizing um, having a diverse group of stakeholders and folks crafting the policy from the beginning so that we're making sure that our agricultural supports are are serving everyone and um, and you know the other the other thing that comes up here is that um, many young farmers are trying to um, be part of a regional farming economy where they are selling directly to farmers and so um, in Philadelphia where you are especially the the land that is close enough to do that is so expensive. So it, it that also goes back to that question of farmer for farmland affordability. Thanks, Karen. I didn't mean to throw a, a curveball. I just kind of, you know, these trends are really important. Uh, uh, none of this is happening in a vacuum. Uh, you know, everything that is going on in our society really does have an impact on one side or the other. And uh, I, I didn't want to throw a curveball, but I just wanted to kind of hear your perspective on on this. So I, I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate you uh, you taking that taking that on. Um, again, thanks again, uh, Karen. Um, as you mentioned, a, a key part of ensuring the future um, of ag is focusing on efforts engaging young people in agriculture. Um, so I, I wanted to turn it over to uh, uh, Stefan. Um, your organization, Manners, focuses specifically on minority students in agriculture, natural resources, and related sciences. Can you talk about uh, your work with Manners and uh, your organization's efforts to promote uh, opportunities as well as your own experiences that brought you to agriculture? Sure, I would absolutely love to. And again, I, it's always a pleasure to work with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Um, Secretary Redding, you are a godsend. Um, and it has truly been a blessing to work with you. Um, with that being said, uh, my name is Stephon Fitzpatrick. I'm the Region 1 and 2 Brad Vice President for the National Manners Organization. For those that don't know, Manners stands for Minorities in Agricultural, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences. Um, we, we thrive off the motto, live, linking hands by changing the face of agriculture. Um, and I just want you to think on that when I say linking hands by changing the face of agriculture. Um, our organization focuses on the professional leadership development of minority students and people of color um, that are interested in career um, funding or educational opportunities um, within the agriculture related industry. Um, I think it's very important. Um, this panel is so critical um, and it's, it's extremely personal for me um, in that diversity is always the topic of a lot of organizations, right? Um, diversity is always brought to the table, but there's not a lot of people that sit around the table that look like the diversity that they're trying to implement. And I think when we start addressing um, the actions that need to come behind the words of the strategic planning that needs to happen, we can truly um, tackle a lot of these issues. Um, our organization works with several, um, with hundreds of organizations to across the country um, to help promote um, the minority advancement in this particular industry. 
um, I love what was previously stated. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, the gentrification and the relocation and urbanization and how this is impacting um, our communities. Um, our organization really does that groundwork. A lot of people in my encounters say, you know, where can we go to find these people, you know, to find this diversity and these people of color? The National Manners Organization has that pipeline of, of well-qualified um, students and, and people and members, whether it be junior, um, our, our junior manners or our undergraduate and graduate students or our alumni and our professionals. Um, our organization works close with, you know, the major organizations like 4-H and FFA. Um, and I want to segue a little bit so that you guys can understand my experience. Um, I've been involved with agriculture for the last 17 years. Um, and in my 17 years of experience, um, there were some highs, but there were definitely some lows, right? Um, when you look at me, I'm 6'4", I'm a 295-pound African-American male. Um, when people see me, all they see is a football player. Um, people ask if I play basketball. Um, and when people hear, you know, how educated I am or where I come from, um, it's always like, oh my gosh, wow, right? And what I, what I wanted to do over these years was eliminate that culture shock, right? Um, this organization, agriculture, um, it's a people business and it's, you should not have to be selective for who gets to benefit from that, this, you know, from this industry, um, because we all need it to survive. Right. And so when I look at my experience coming up, starting off in FFA, I was exposed to it in seventh grade. I was a military kid. Um, I traveled the country. Um, I was in a different school every two years. Um, and finding what was passionate for me was, was a challenge. And I was exposed to agriculture in the seventh grade um, through the FFA organization. And I was the only black kid in the room, right? I've been to state conventions. I've been a, I was fortunate to be a chapter president. Um, I've been to the national conventions. I've traveled the world in agriculture and I even got a full ride to college because of it. But even with that, I always had to work harder. I always had to justify why I was here. I always had to prove a point to someone. I always had to kind of play the game um, in a sense so that I could assimilate and not be the, how can I say it, the problem child for a lot of these organizations. And, you know, I experienced that, you know, working with a government agency. You know, I, right out of high school, I got a full ride to college that gave me a government job that sent me to Wisconsin. You know, and at 18, I was working with the U.S. Forest Service, um, you know, on the Shawamigan and Nicolay National Forest up there as a forest technician because I originally wanted to get into, you know, fighting forest fires and sustainability. And I'm into landscape design and things of that nature. And, you know, I, I had people who were with the Forest Service for 30 years intimidated by an 18-year-old Black kid that was passionate about the same thing that they were passionate for, right? Um, in my experiences, you know, I've had hate mail. Um, I was chased home by mobs, you know, at 18, you know, when you move out of, out of your parents' house five days after you graduate to chase something that you love and you're directly in the middle of an environment where people aren't exposed to a culture because they choose not to, it makes it hard to drive that passion. And so here I am 17 years later in a position now where I'm the coordinator for the School of Agriculture for the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. I am on these national panels. I've sat in Secretary Purdue's office where we talked one-on-one -on -one about opportunities. At 32, I came from an environment that didn't think this industry was for me. And now I'm directly in a position where I can truly go out and find these students to say, hey, someone looks like you, someone can be successful, and you don't have to keep succumbing to the issues of this society. And I think um, in a way, I'm glad that this country has been in turmoil because it's it's able to raise a lot of questions that a lot of people try to ignore, right? I think it's a lot of, it's a lot easier for some to push things under the rug, um, and then when when they're confronted with how to address it, um, is when um, you know a lot of people kind of start panicking, right, and start creating their strategic plans and things of that nature. Um, so, I, with that being said, I want to say thank you, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, because you have been one of the most engaging state organizations that I've had the pleasure of working with when it comes to addressing this topic. Um, I've spoken on several panels over the last eight months. And I, I have to say every time I get on, and I, I don't I don't want to apologize for my passion, but for those that don't know me, um, this is something that agriculture saved my life. I could have easily fell to the stereotypes, 
right? Um, but I want people to know that there are educated African Americans, people of color, LGBTQ, um, that love this industry, that would die for this industry, and that will continue to make this their life's work. Um, so with that being said, um, for any information about the National Manners Organization, you can go to national, um, you can go to www.mannersmanrs.org um, just to see the, the framework of our organization. Um, we're forever growing, we're forever building, and I would love to continue to, continue to connect and advocate for minorities in agriculture. Thank you so much, Stefan. Um, you know, your story, I, I can totally identify. I'm 32 years old as well. I'm from Camden, New Jersey, and you know, gay Puerto Rican kid from Camden, it, you know, they, we're not expected to end up anywhere, right? So, um, you know, thank you so much. Keep keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, it's it, we always get kind of boxed out of liking agriculture. We get boxed out of liking trees. We get boxed out of liking plants. And um, it's such a natural thing um, as part of our experience as people of color. And I think that you know, colonialism and, and slavery and all these other really intense social traumas have really separated us from the, the wanting to connect to the soil and wanting to understand, you know, that our food is, uh, you know, something that's medicine, right? Everything you eat is, it's going to affect your body. Um, so, you know, I, I think the, the, the conversations around how the industry, um, you know, kind of, uh, not kind of, but, it, you know, pushes people out to the margins. Um, really comes from something so much deeper. So keep doing that work. I I definitely want to connect offline. I, I'm glad that you know Ashley and the team at the Department of Agriculture um, got got you on the panel. I, I'm, I'm I'm really excited to to connect with you uh, off of this. Raphael, I do want to say this, and thank you so much for that. And I do want to say this for anyone that's listening to this call um, that is passionate about making a change in this organization. I challenge you and your organizations to start focusing on the experiences and the trauma of this organization on certain people of color. When you can understand the, the experiences, you can then properly strategize. We are not placeholders. Don't just do these things just to say, hey, I checked the box, but ensure that you're creating initiatives and, and programs so that these people can come on board, be successful, and then pass that down to the people um, that are also passionate. So that's my TED talk. And thank you so much, Raphael. I, I'm, I'm definitely glad to be here and let's definitely connect. Thank you so much, Stefan. Um, uh, definitely great conversations going on. Um, so Caleb, uh, you work for Verse and Strategies uh, and it draws on a, a culmination of lifetime experiences from uh, 4-H to FFA, uh, the oldest uh, organization for uh, vocational student organizations in the country, uh, by the way. Um, and, and, uh, and tell me a little bit about your time as an ag educator. Can you share a little, a little bit uh, with us on how your experiences shaped your work in promoting diversity in ag? Sure. Well, thanks so much, Raphael, for for hosting this panel. It's your it's a panel to be on, and and I'm I'm so honored to be with such a great group of individuals. Also, my thanks to Secretary Redding. Um, I just want to start off by saying thanks to you um, for taking the direction from some of your team members and saying, you know what, this is an important conversation. Thanks to your team for then pulling to get this together and making it a part of Farm Show. What better celebration for Pennsylvania agriculture do we have than our our state Farm Show? And so for this to be a, a part of that, to me, says this is a really important part of what you envision the future of agriculture. And, and as we look at all 50 states and, and their departments and what we can look to USDA and doing and supporting from a federal level, um, thank you so much for your leadership and the leadership of your team. It, I think it, it, it's second to none, and I appreciate it. Um, I was born the, the grandson of a, of a local veterinarian um, in, in central Pennsylvania, and in fact, um, the, the poster behind me was a Christmas gift. Um, it, was a, it was a poster that... Uh, um, a medicine supply company sent to my grandfather and my grandmother always loved it. I always loved it. It's a, it's a Hereford cow with a veterinarian um, after a calving and the farmer and, and his, his son kind of peeking over a gate. And you know, I always dreamed of being a veterinarian uh, growing up. Uh, my mom was still the office manager for the practice, but um, went to Penn State and realized that uh, chemistry was not going to be friendly to me and in my dreams to <laughs> become a veterinarian. So quickly jumped to education um, after a lot of amazing experiences in 4-H and FFA growing up and 
Um, I did, after a short stint of time in the classroom, um, landed working for Versant Strategies. We're a public affairs firm with a specialization in agriculture issues and rural affairs. Um, we lobby on behalf of Fortune 500 companies to the smallest of organizations and also support their organizational management and structure um, from a wide variety of settings. So it's, it's an amazing position that I get to help lift up the issues of rural Pennsylvania on a, on a daily basis. But as your, as your question stated, you know, I, I did. I, I grew up in 4-H and FFA, and I'm actually on the family farm right now. I was up through the middle of the night helping with uh, some kids and, and making sure that we're, we're being as, as supportive <laughs> as a productive farm here in, in Huntington County, Pennsylvania. Um, but through the course of the week, you know, on normal, more normal time, um, I live in the city of Harrisburg with my partner, Ryan, um, and come to the farm on the weekend. So really get the best of both worlds. Um, but I think what led me to, to, to really be cognizant of diversity was, was what I didn't see growing up. Um, being a, an LGBT individual in rural central Pennsylvania, I didn't see a lot of people who looked like what I felt like, if as weird as that says. And you know, I know Secretary Redding often talks about your senses and, and all these senses that farm show and agriculture brings to light. You know, to think that I didn't see what I felt and I knew that something wasn't quite, I don't want to say right, but just seemed a little different growing up, um, really made me start to think about things. Um, you know, and according to the Trevor Project, which which works to curb statistics such as this, notes that homosexual youth, um, those in the LGBT community, are three times as likely to comp contemplate and five times as likely to attempt suicide as their heterosexual counterparts in the same age group is shocking. Further research suggests that this is just as impactful in rural communities because of this concept of, of minority stress, right? Whenever you don't see and feel a connection to people around you who are like you, there's this concept of minority stress and, and, it, and it, it, it exacerbates itself in, in LGBT youth in, in rural areas. Pennsylvania is, is no different, having one of the largest rural populations in our country. Um, what oftentimes we think about these individuals and, and how do we form these connections? It's whenever we leave uh, our rural roots, our homes, uh, our home farms to find these connections. And, and then what happens? Oftentimes we, we find other paths and, and end up not coming home. And I'm gonna touch on that in, in just a minute. Um, I, I think whenever I consider diversity in, in agriculture, you know, I also consider some of the small things that happen in our industry um, that folks not feel welcome. And, and while I value the role that organizations such as Pennsylvania Farm Bureau has within our industry, advocating for farmers and, and elevating and raising the voices of concern of, of Pennsylvania agriculturalists, this year they voted to affirm in their policy manual uh, a policy that Farm Bureau opposes same-sex marriage, an issue that was solved in the courts back in 2015. So when we think about the barriers, as, as Stefan had mentioned earlier, these barriers to enter into the industry, and Karen also brought up you know, the need for workforce development and bringing folks into the fold. As an industry, when we bring these barriers, barriers towards us, it's, it's interesting for us to consider the challenges that we're now facing, the need for workforce development, the concern about where our next generation of farmers is going to be coming from. Um, all this to say, you know, there are amazing things happening across Pennsylvania agriculture. So there are groups, you know, uh, I know uh, PASA Sustainable Agriculture holds a special roundtable and discussions and networking opportunities for those in the LGBT community and across multiple forms of the inclusion, diversity and equity spectrum. Um, they've created a great conversation. There's groups like the Cultivating Change Foundation based out of California but is actively working to engage students on college campuses that are LGBT and allies. It's not just those in the community, but it's also the allies as well, pulling them into the fold and, and engaging and creating this network, this connection. How do we keep people in agriculture? It's this feeling of connection that I think is so very important. And I hope that all of the other panelists also would agree to. I think, um, you know, about when I started to, when I came out personally, and when I started to form these connections with other LGBT agriculturalists, you know, I found a great community. And I'm thankful that to this day, I do come home to the family farm on the weekends. Uh, I do really enjoy my, my job in public policy. And, and it's hard to, to work in central Pennsylvania unless you're able to do it via Zoom and in the policy circle. 
Um, but I think about my friends as well and, and their stories and what they've accomplished. Those that are generations older than generations to come and the way that they found a place in agriculture and the value that they've put on their companies that have made a specific focus and push to engage uh, in employees that are LGBT, um, organizations that they engage in that have a space that elevates and celebrates those in the LGBT plus community. Um, I think that as we look, and as I mentioned before, for, as we, as agriculture as an industry discusses this need for workforce development, discusses the concern about where our next generation to come, I think, you know, these barriers to entry um, and, and these policies that some organizations and the way that some individuals bring these groups into the fold are so very important in making and, and creating this connection of agriculturalists across the Commonwealth. And I think a lot of the organizations that we are coming from really focus on that. And I think that's one thing that makes the, the group of panelists here very, very special. Raphael, I also want to compliment you and the work that the commission is doing. Um, I know you've asked questions and, and have engaged, um, recognizing that um, LGBT issues do not just impact uh, city centers, where oftentimes it's, it's I don't want to say easier to find folks who want to really um, grab the horns of the issue and, and really go to task. But I, I thank you, Raphael, for your interest in rural issues for LGBT individuals and as on the commission. Um, I think it's very important. And I think it's that work, um, the work of individuals in the community that recognize LGBT issues are not just rural issues. They're not just ag issues. There's not just urban issues, um, but they're issues that everyone faces. And especially as we look at agriculture, feeding the world. Um, I think it's extremely important for us to keep inclusion, diver diversity and equity there in the center of our conversation. Um, I thank our allies that have also gone to task to support those around us. And I think, um, you know, it's not just us on the on the conversation, but those individuals who make, um, uncon you know, the, the conscious and, and sometimes the unconscious decisions that they make, um, not recognizing of what they're doing to elevate folks that, that have truly made a big impact for, for those in the community. Uh, so, Raphael, thanks so much for, for the question, and I look forward to hearing from the other panelists on, on the great work that they're doing. Thank you so much, Caleb. I, I really appreciate the kind words. Um, you know, as a person who's been doing uh, this work with the commission for a little bit over a year, uh, actually a year and one month, um, what I found was that the vast majority of discrimination, hate crimes, uh, you know, pretty much the, the, the ugly of the ugly has been occurring in suburban and rural Pennsylvania. And um, many of those um, places, municipalities don't have protections uh, against discrimination. Uh, many people uh, in rural Pennsylvania who identify as LGBT can't find jobs. So they leave those areas uh, because, you know, they can't participate in the agricultural industry. So, you know, th th there's so much work to be done. Um, you know, I, I've always talked to people uh, when I was working in my, and I'll keep this brief, but when I was working in the urban farm, um, you know, I would meet people from, you know, volunteers from, from Georgia, uh, Christian volunteers, kids who've never seen uh, uh, Latinos or, or gay people or, you know, anything different than themselves. And, uh, and we would have discussions and those discussions always happen while pulling weeds, while digging a ditch. And it showed that, you know, we can all do this work together. We can all, you know, help grow together while having conversations and working. And I've had some of the most rich discussions with people while, you know, my hands covered in mud and weeds and, you know, thorns and all types of other things. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of hope there that we can really uh, move the conversation forward and uh, and continue to, to dismantle hate and not just our Commonwealth, but in our world. So thank you so much, Caleb, for those kind words. Um, Secretary Redding, can you talk a little bit about the work that the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture has done to bolster youth involvement and engagement in agriculture? How has the department changed its approach to inclusion and equity? Yeah, I'd love to, and, and I'll be sensitive to time since we've got a couple of folks who, who want to jump in. I want to hear from them. Uh, as we think about you know, the youth, uh, even our theme, you know, cultivating tomorrow, we're, we're not going to do a lot of cultivation unless there's somebody inspired to do it. Right, and it's a new generation and, and trying to really be supportive of our youth. We do that through the 4-H and the FFA organizations. It's at the heart of the Commission on Agriculture Excellence that was formed several years ago that we work in partnership with the Department of Education. Uh, it's what we do to support our land grant mission here in the state. 
Uh, it's what we do in the farm bill. And if you look at that farm bill, it was historic. The governor championed that three years ago. Uh, and, we're, and we're part of that uh, this week in, in, in this panel series as well. Uh, you look at some of the programs, like uh, it used to be ag and rural youth. You know, we reframed that to be ag and youth, right? Get rid of the rural, not that they aren't important, but be inclusive to bring urban in uh, is, is a really good uh, change that we've made. The farm to school initiative that we do keeps kids connected. Uh, there's so many youth uh, focused efforts. We try to capture that in our, our general programming, but it's also part of our farm show uh, this week. A lot to talk about there, but just to say that that's the external part. Internal, you know, working on um, building the relationship with uh, Stefan and Manners, I think has really been uh, helpful to us to understand the dimensions of race and issues and learn from, from him and, and uh, Manners organization uh, to really look at what we're doing internal. We've said often that it's one thing to have a conversation about the industry and the external, but we also have to live that and look like that internally, right? So those changes are important. Uh, and just a, a final point, you know, it's difficult as the, uh, you know, the virtual farm show has been to pull off and, and you know, to present. I would also turn it around and say that it gives us a chance to go places to people uh, and have conversations that are really difficult to do right, uh, inside the, the physical farm show uh, facility. So while we're proud to have uh, 500,000 people come to the farm show, uh, the virtual platform gives us a chance to go to 12 and a half million people, right, and engage them in the discussion we've just had and many others about the future of agriculture and how important it is, uh, but always remind our, ourselves that there has to be somebody inspired to do this uh, in bringing all the people all that diversity and young uh, energy to the table. So thank you. Thank you, Secretary. And thank you for uh, reminding me about time. Uh, <laughs> definitely, it's a rich <laughs> discussion. Uh, so Abby, uh, the Secretary mentioned that the Department of continues to seek uh, um, uh, to improve uh, its inclusion efforts in partnership with organizations like Penn State. Uh, Agribility is a part of Penn State. Can you talk a little bit about your work and uh, how that how that has furthered partnerships? Yes, uh, and thank you, thank you, Secretary Redding, and everyone participating and for this opportunity and for including Agribility today. I'm excited to share what we do, how partnerships play a huge role in our project, and how Agribility brings a unique perspective to yet another aspect of diversity in agriculture. Agribility for Pennsylvanians is a statewide project consisting of a partnership between Penn State Extension and UCP of Central PA. We work with farmers and agricultural workers, really anyone who is in agriculture, who has a disability or a long-term health condition, such as a spinal cord injury, an amputation, or arthritis. We provide a range of free services and educational resources, including an on-site farm assessment. That is my favorite part of the project. And based on the assessment, we provide identification of assistive technology, modifications, and resources that can help the individual remain successful in agriculture. However, the impacts of what we do are broad, reaching beyond the individual, to include positive impacts for the farm business, their friends and families, and the community at large. An example of a recommendation we might make could be for a lift device that mounts to the side of a tractor. This device can enable a wheelchair user or someone who has difficulty accessing a tractor, the ability to access their tractor safely and independently. But to really understand the impact of what our project does, I encourage you to visit our website or social media pages at Agribility PA to read the stories of some of the farmers that we have worked to support. Disabilities and long-term health conditions do not discriminate. Our health and our ability to persevere is something we all have in common. We meet farmers every year from a multitude of backgrounds with unique experiences and goals. Our goal is to keep them working in agriculture. As Secretary Redding mentioned, it's vital to remove barriers. This is the key focus of our project. Farming with a disability or a long-term health condition 
does come with it, its own set of barriers, such as difficulty accessing equipment, mobility limitations, higher levels of stress on your body, extreme fatigue, or facing doubt from family members in the community. However, farming with a disability or a health condition is not only viable, but it's full of amazing opportunities. Individuals who have disabilities should not be overlooked when it comes to careers in agriculture. I am continually inspired by the farmers we work with and the accomplish accomplishments they make when they work to overcome barriers they may face. In addition, Agribility PA is committed to reaching diverse audiences within Pennsylvania's farming population, including aging farmers, beginning or new farmers, veterans, women, Amish, and socially, socially disadvantaged and underserved populations who are working in agriculture with a disability or health condition. To provide services and to meet the individualized needs of our farmers, Agribility PA works with many partners and collaborators. For example, when working with veterans, we frequently collaborate with other projects such as the PA Veteran Farming Project, the Farmer Veteran Coalition, the Department of Military and Veteran Affairs, and Homegrown by Heroes and PA Preferred Initiatives. This enables us to provide a wider range of resources to our farmers and to connect them with groups and peers who share similar backgrounds and experiences along with diverse perspectives. In fact, we just received a new referral from the PA Veteran Farming Project, and we referred several farmers to the Farmer Veteran Coalition Fellowship Fund, which is currently accepting applications. We also value partnerships with the Pennsylvania Office of Rural Health and Latinx programs within Penn State Extension when creating, di when creating culturally appropriate information and resources. For instance, key connections with the Pennsylvania Office of Rural Health has supported outreach to the Plain community. These are just a sample of the many partnerships that lead to success for our project and our farmers. We are continually open to new collaborations that foster inclusion and diversity while keeping our focus on supporting individuals in agriculture who have a disability or health condition. Thank you again, Secretary Redding, hosts and fellow panelists for allowing Agribility to be a part of this diverse group and the 2021 Pennsylvania Farm Show. Thank you so much, Abby. The work you're doing is extremely important. Uh, many people don't you know, take uh, accessibility into account in, in not just agriculture, but across every, um, you know, every industry and every, um, every experience of life. So thank you so much for the work that you all are doing. And, uh, and Penn State Extension has been just great with urban agriculture as well. Um, Tani, uh, the secretary mentioned uh, your efforts around urban agriculture and food security. Great segue. Can you uh, share with us your experiences in these two fields and how your experience is working in government and nonprofits, as well as your personal experiences help uh, shape this work? Rafael, thank you for the question. And it's been an honor uh, being part of this distinguished uh, panel. Thank you, Secretary Redding and all the staff too, right? So if you don't mind, can I share some of the picture? I'm a very visual person and I love to share uh, on uh, uh, what we do and also in the same time answering your question, if it is okay with you. Okay. I will, um, yeah, I think our technology people will take care of that. Yes, there we go. <laughs> yes, can you see my screen? Okay, thank you so much, Rafael. Um, so yeah, uh, answering this question, um, I actually uh, coming to United States back at 2001, right? And uh, um, immigrant from Indonesia. So I totally relate to uh, some of your um, story about how women starting their urban garden, that actually how we did it. Uh, my husband actually uh, coming to the country also 2001, and then we met in Philadelphia. We get married at uh, uh, 11 years ago, right? So uh, this is most likely what it looks like breakfast for American, right? Like a really greasy bacon. And uh, this is not what, what breakfast looks like um, in a majority Asian country, especially in my country, Indonesia, right? So, but we do have 
have a lot of food that uh, we cook with oil, right? And because of the not knowledge of uh, United States system, what is the plumbing and a certain thing, we actually trashing this bacon oil and also the uh, cooking oil down the drain, right? So that's how we start with feed the barrel. We feed the dirty oil to the barrel. So we are low income in immigrant people that do not know any better back then, right? Not trashing our oil down the drain. That actually caused a lot of um, problem with us, right? A lot of house getting clogged and we live in South Philadelphia mostly. You know how dense South Philadelphia is. So we have no idea by trashing oil down the drain that actually causing a lot of backlog and also clogging and end up our basement get flood and it's become like really, really bad and nasty, right? And then also back to the breakfast, right? We usually in Asia, we don't eat a lot of meat for breakfast. This is actually what we ate, right? We ate a lot of green stuff. Uh, we ate a lot of, uh, in this picture his, here is bitter melon. And uh, we ate a lot of long bean. And this is like a different type of long bean because usually it's green color, but this is like a, a really nice purple color and a really, really beautiful. And uh, we ate a uh, lemongrass uh, for our uh, breakfast drink and spinach, right? A uh, sweet melon for uh, our breakfast too. So a lot of things at this picture, we actually couldn't find it all the time in a grocery store, right? Especially things like this and things like this. We need to go to certain grocery store um, and we are lucky if we live in Philadelphia. If we are immigrant coming from different country, living in suburban Pennsylvania, where is a uh, Asian grocery store, a Dominican uh, grocery store, couldn't we couldn't find anywhere in rural area, right? So they need to travel all the way to either a bigger city like Philadelphia or Pittsburgh to find all this vegetable, and that's create disconnected, right? It's create really a missing and uh, um, disconnect with the uh, home country, right? So then uh, 11 years ago, we start um, looking what we could do for the community. Uh, our community missing to touch the ground, to play with the mud, to kind of like really growing something that we knew that we could eat without actually depending on the grocery store. Um, and what is really interesting, back home in our country, in Asia, in Indonesia, vegetable, quote unquote, organic vegetable is much more affordable compared to meat, right? So our diet also changed. Back then, we ate like maybe 90% vegetable compared to meat, right? Because we couldn't afford meat. But when we start coming to United States, especially to Pennsylvania, where milk is so affordable, uh, uh, bacon um, is so affordable, um, and also other meat is so affordable, we change that diet and we miss, we miss a lot of diet like uh, we have back home. So uh, we purchased this property in uh, South Philadelphia, close to Southwest Philadelphia, we are, we, where we are so lucky that we have backyard and side yard, right? And it's not big at all, but we start like with our backyard and we expand it to our side yard. And uh, imagine with this small urban farming effort, we was able to feed hundreds of hundreds of family. And um, if you see in this picture, lots of churches actually starting contacting us, right? We are so happy that like, uh, of course, this is before COVID, right? 2016, 17, 18, we have uh, on the summer, like between five to 10 church bringing their kids because their kids is actually never touch the real uh, tomato plant. They never touch what their mom cooking, like the uh, the plant itself, right? So uh, we, we open our uh, garden to educate a lot of kids. And beside that also, we are so lucky 
uh, we have connection uh, with uh, local uh, bilingual uh, uh, kids book author that's look at our garden in Facebook and they contacting us. They say like, hey, your garden looks fabulous. How about we work together and create a kids book in uh, multiple different languages so the kids could learn how to garden through books. And we're like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's such a great idea. And of course, during COVID, now we like we couldn't really read to the kids directly. We do it like we're pivoting to a um, platform, which is uh, YouTube. So we read the books uh, for the kids through YouTube, right? And of course, this is the picture from two years ago where the farm show actually live, we could meet, right? And uh, it's it's such a wonderful experience back then. And that's Secretary Redding on the left and uh, with other panel. And that's this is the book that I'm uh, sharing with you, uh, the Heichel's Garden, right? But if you wanna see um, our uh, information, that's my phone number. And that's a Heichel Garden Facebook and a Fit the Barrel Facebook. But you also could go to YouTube here. And, uh, oh, wait, where's the YouTube that I want to show? Uh, on the YouTube, we actually uh, have um, Morning Circle Re Media um, um, reading uh, the book. This is how it looks like. For all the other farmers who help little things grow. The snow is melting. Our seedlings are ready to plant. Let's get to work. Bring the wood to frame the bed. You see that uh, we have, we read it in English and we have the subtitle in Indonesian. And this publication actually have the book in Spanish, in Arabic, in Haitian, in French, and multiple other languages. So uh, compared to other organization in this panel, um, uh, our work is actually very local. We do a lot of uh, like a local Philadelphian, but we are very honored. Uh, Temple University, uh, UPenn, they send students to our garden to learn about sustainability, food security, and the cultural connection, food, and a back home uh, with our country. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you so much, honey. Um, definitely important work. Um, I can see so many parallels to the, the community garden that I used to be engaged with. So love to see it in Philadelphia. We're a green country town, as William Penn said. Uh, so uh, Desi, your organization, Movement of Immigrant Leaders in PA, focuses on advocacy and education for immigrant families across the Commonwealth. Can you share with us how your organization, in partnership with the government and other entities, support these families? Yes, thank you, Rafael. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you all to all the panelists today for inviting us on this important panel. Uh, MIFA stands for the Movement of Immigrant Leaders in Pennsylvania. We are a network of families across the Commonwealth who educate, organize, and cultivate participation in our community for human rights. I'm the proud granddaughter of immigrants. My grandfather came to this country from Yemen uh, in the 1920s, and my great grandparents came here from Mexico in the same period. Like my grandparents, many of our members in MIFA make up the workforce of our nation's most critical industries, including our agriculture sector, and are leaders in our beloved agriculture community across the nation, and that's why I'm on this panel with you all today. A 2017 report published in partnership with Team Pennsylvania and the Department of Agriculture in Pennsylvania estimated that there are 65,000 hired agricultural workers across the at least thousand farms here in Pennsylvania. That same report using national figures estimates that nearly two-thirds of those workers are immigrants and that nearly one out of two or nearly half are undocumented. During this current and ongoing health and economic crisis, workers in the agriculture sector have remained working and have sustained the people of this of this commonwealth. Our members in MIFA work in berries, in mushrooms, pine trees, apples, 
potatoes, eggs, in meat factories, and in vegetable and fruit packing. We want to take this moment to thank all of those workers who've been working tirelessly throughout this pandemic and, and before then. Um, we thank each and every one of you. It is well known the vital impact of immigrant workers and families across our food system. Yet these same families are denied basic recognition for their labor. They are denied respect because of their immigration status. They are denied basic rights that include labor rights, the right to citizenship in this country that they produce wealth and food for. And here in Pennsylvania, families are denied the right to a driver's license and state issued identification. In Milpa, our members right now are working on two key changes that would undoubtedly be positive impact to our food systems here in Pennsylvania. And more importantly, would bring a semblance of safety to the hundreds of thousands of immigrant workers, their families, their children, and our communities in towns and cities across Pennsylvania. The first is an effort to allow people to get a driver's license regardless of their immigration status. People in our state were able to obtain a driver's license and state issued ID prior to 2002 using an individual tax identification number or an ITIN. This is a federal identifier used to pay taxes by many who do not have a social security number. Not having access to a driver's license means that, that our members cannot get to work safely. It means the threat of arrest or deportation when driving your children to school or to the doctor. Every child in our Commonwealth has a right to feel safe and secure in our community. To not be fearful of losing a parent or to deportation. That is a basic right of every child. As leaders in the Driving Pennsylvania Forward Coalition, we're calling on the, our state legislature to make this right um, to make this a right for the sake of public safety and for the hundreds of thousands of families who this state depends on. A bipartisan bill proposed by Representative Danilo Burgos and supported by Chairman Hennessy and many others last session would make this critical, the critical changes needed to allow for the public safety on our roads and for the security of workers and their families. Rep Burgos's bill would do a few things. One, it would allow folks to again obtain a driver's license using the tax identification number or other identifiers like a birth certificate um, or um, other identifiers to, to identify themselves. Two, this, um, his proposal would allow folks to um, obtain what we call an unmarked driver's license, a standard issued driver's license that doesn't identify their immigration status. And three, uh, this bill would allow for folks to, um, for people's information to um, remain private, to only be accessed um, with a criminal warrant or with their consent, um, which is really key, a key part of this bill. Uh, you can sign a petition and help support this effort by visiting our website, drivingpennsylvaniaforward.org. And nationally, I want to take this opportunity to say that we're also building support for a comprehensive immigration reform that would allow the estimated 11 million undocumented in our country a pathway to citizenship. We know that many farmers are hoping for the issuance of more work visas and guest workers to fill the incredible need for labor on our farms. In Milpa, we want to take these opportunities to educate and ask Pennsylvanians to demand full citizenship for all those workers who come and hold up this industry and who have been here sustaining the Commonwealth for decades. Like my grandparents and so many other generations of immigrants to this country, we have to ensure that people are able to fully live and love and grow here. We are grateful to the many people across Pennsylvania who have stepped up and stepped out to call for immigration reform, um, who see the dire need for our families and our communities and the many farmers who have been leaders on this effort for four decades. Um, we thank you, and we're going into 2021 united on this front. We can do so much good for so many families in our communities, and we need each and every one of you to make it happen. Everyone on this panel knows the agriculture sector and farming communities face many struggles going into the future. Any legislative efforts here in Pennsylvania or nationally to support Pennsylvania farm families must include these changes and must begin to have workers at the center as we build the, the necessary solutions to the many challenges the sector is facing. Farming communities and farmers, Milpa members and immigrant leaders have all been a key, key in forging solutions in our Commonwealth and we thank you. Thank you for inviting us to be part of this panel. 
Thank you so much, Desi. Uh, it's such an important topic. You know, uh, immigrants make up the vast majority of the agriculture labor force um, in, in all aspects throughout the, the supply chain. So, um, you know, that's something that's very near and dear to, to me personally. My uh, grandfather came over here as a migrant worker from Puerto Rico uh, on an airplane filled with lawn chairs. And, uh, and, you know, we're talking about something that's systemic. So thank you so much. And I wanted to thank all the panelists. Everyone's been excellent. This has been such a rich discussion. I'm, I feel inspired, um, you know, to, to kind of re get into uh, the agricultural stuff in my background. And I just wanted to turn it over to the, uh, Secretary Redding uh, to give us our closing remarks. Yeah, Raphael, thank you. And, and to the panel, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure I can say it any better. Right, the discussion of the last hour or so, uh, the faces on this screen, the stories you tell, uh, the passion you each shared here, but I also know you have for both the work that you're doing, the communities you serve, uh, and agriculture. And I really uh, very much appreciate that. You know, if 2020, uh, you know, uh, sent us a message, and, and certainly this panel, uh, reminds us uh, about the importance of being intentional, right? Intentional about caring for our neighbors, uh, doing the right thing, and knowing that sometimes doing the right thing is, is a, you know, makes us all nervous, right? But we also look around, and I take from this panel, the real necessity that if we're gonna talk about, you know, cultivating that tomorrow, that that tomorrow has to be inclusive. It has to be diverse. It has to be one that we are in together in recognition that uh, for any of us, agriculture or even our commonwealth to go forward and see that tomorrow that I spoke of in the introduction, that is a full partnership. And to stand together as Desi had, had asked us to do uh, applies to all of the different issues. So uh, just thank you all for enriching the conversation, our vision, this farm show, uh, and our Commonwealth. And thank you very much for doing what you're doing uh, to make this a better place and a better industry. Thank you.